Welcome to Q&A with Andrew Carlson. Good to see you tonight. Looks like we have a few people plus a thousand angels that are inquiring into this little time of repartee. Haha, yeah, there are some new questions tonight. Are you interested in starting out with a good one? Yeah, let's hear it. All right. Are the Philistines and Palestinians the same people referred to by the Bible? As far as I understand, they are. But I used to, I used to think that um, for some reason I thought that the Bible commands us to, commanded them to, to wipe out Philistines. But Amalekites. But, but when I when I looked into it, I didn't actually see a passage which said a command to wipe out the Philistines. So, um, I, don't I, I do. There is. You don't you don't think there's a passage no. you're saying? No, I know there's one. It says to, to wipe out the Amalekites or Amalekites. Right. But I don't think there's any concerning the Philistines. In fact, aren't they prophesied to be around for a while? You know, both of those words come from the same word, Peleset, or which means sea peoples. Uh, the Philistines and Palestinians both come from sea people, which is the meaning of Peleset, and their understanding that Peleset is somewhere over there in the Greek islands that they originated from, but they don't know for sure. So I'd say yes, too, because... They're, they both come from the same literal word and place. So what's the implication of that? Um, that? Like, because, you know, the Palestinians are trying to claim part of the land of Israel as their own land. Do they have a right to that, or are they in the wrong? That is a thorny question, isn't it? Uh, I've got, they've got a right to try, but you remember the reason that most of this uproar happened was that the uh, king of Syria and Jordan said, oh, just abandon your property and come over here. We'll take care of you. And then we're going to destroy Israel so you can go back and get your property again. So a lot of Palestinians decided, yeah, that's right. They're going to come in and destroy Israel. We're all going to come back here eventually anyway. And then the war came, and they didn't destroy Israel. So now they're complaining that Israel stole their land because they all left. They left. So I guess um, possession, well, ownership is 90% possession or something like that. Who has that land now? Who's got the rule over it? It's their land. It's like we don't call this the land of the Navajos anymore or the Wampanoags because they're, they're still there, but they don't have any power except over casinos. Well, the thing is, like, um, there's a lot of the people don't realize this, but like, like if you start analyzing the Bible and in light of modern values, you know, it, ancient Israel, based on how they were commanded by God to do stuff, yeah. they would be they would be considered uh, they would be considered like. Uh, terrorists and all kinds of crazy stuff they would be considered like um in violation of of human rights you know the the after world war ii they came up with like a list of things of, of how human rights violations yeah and there's so many things that ancient israel did by command of god supposedly according to what the bible says it was commanded by god mm -hmm they would be uh, horrific in the eyes of modern evaluation of their morality. Like, you know, there, there's, there's genocide in the Bible of, of Israelites being commanded to do it. Like we talked about the, Mal the Amalekites. 
there is some pretty crazy stuff there compared to modern values. Absolutely. But, and it's just interesting. I was re researching this um, last week, but the thing is, there's actually like the whole debate about whether certain war things are justified or not is very interesting because if you take America, for example, uh, the USA, uh, what's going on right now with some of the crazy stuff going on with the, with the uh, po political climate of where it's possible there won't be a conceding, you know, there's been some fear about the possibility of war. I don't think it'll lead to that, but you never know. Uh, anything's possible. But uh, the reason I say all that is because there's discussion about whether it's justified. Is it justified for a civil war to be started over what's going on right now? Is it just was it justified when when they did the civil war back in the uh, 19th century? But even more prior to that, was it justified for the colonies to declare independence from uh, Britain. The little bit I've looked at it, I don't see compelling evidence that the colonies were justified. So if, if you're approaching a, it from like a, a uh, critical evaluation, I think there's a good strong case to make that the United States comes out of a rebellion that was not valid. Um, but it's a, it's, it's a thorny issue and it's something that morally ne needs to be debated. But um, many times people say history is written by the winners, the victors. And so when it comes to the thing between Israel and the Palestinians, you come from the approach of the Palestinians and you see that, you know, that they feel like they're, they were there before Israel and, and, and it was stolen from the Palestinians. But we know from history, the Bible and archeology span as well, that um, Israel had it first. And according to ancient, uh, ancient law, and precedent, the original owners are these are supposed to be the perpetual owners. The only time it's not to be the case is if there's a treaty or some type of um, agreement, voluntary agreement, where the original owners agree to give up that land to a new owner. This goes all the way back to Book of Jubilees, which tells us that the land was divided amongst the three sons of Noah and their descendants as inheritance. And it even goes so far as to say that if in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it tells us that if anyone steals land that's not, that does not belong to them, that's a justifiable, that's a justifiable cause for war. Um, and okay, actually, that, that's in the same book, uh, Book of Noah and the Book of Jubilees. Which, which says that if the land is stolen, that's just for the cause of war. And then the war scroll, it tells us that, um, or no, maybe the temple scroll, I don't know. One of the Dead Sea Scrolls, it tells us that war is justified between a nation and another nation if that other nation steals from the one nation. Um, so, when you're trying to think about these issues, it's easy for people to come to the wrong conclusion when they don't take what the Bible has to say into consideration. But when you look at it from the lens of the Bible, a very different moral picture emerges than one that you might see from a secular society. What does a secular society say? It says that Slavery is inherently wrong, and it says the death penalty is wrong. It says abortion is good. It says homosexuality is good. Transgender is good. Um, adultery is not a big deal. Um, 
divorce is completely fine. It's good. All these things are completely in, antagonistic to morality as revealed to us in the Bible. It's polar opposites. And so we're kind of, well, the world we live in today, we're forced to come to terms with this dichotomy between modern morality and Bible morality. And a lot of people, unfortunately, in my opinion, unfortunately, side more with modern values rather than what the Bible has to say. Um, of course, just because the Bible says it doesn't inherently mean it's true, but in general, I do believe the Bible in the originals was divinely inspired. And so I'm going to trust what the Bible says more than what random people living today decide is moral. Because the people that are deciding that, that something is moral or not are corrupt people. Um, anyways, it's all long rambling there. Just, But uh, I think it's a valid issue to think about. The whole thing with Palestine and the connection with the Philistines, I think, is etymologically justified. And so historically, the Philistines have constantly oppressed Israel. But there probably are, are times, maybe even today, where Israel oppresses the Philistines or the Palest Palestinians in uh, without justification. So it's not necessarily a, a um, Israel is the good guys and, and the Philistines are the bad guys. Because we know from the Bible that Israel sometimes was the bad guy. Sometimes they were in sin and, and wickedness. So, but overall, we know from scripture that Israel has the rights to the land and the Philistines must uh, submit to the authority of Israel. If they refuse to be under their authority, then they are to be kicked out of the land, according to the biblical model. Secular so people don't have any basis for morality. They don't have a set basis for any morality, and secular people would disdain anything that the Bible have, has to say. I want to mention one other thing, a couple other things. The matter of just war, that was a big topic of issue in 2003 when the invasion came to Iraq. Everybody was talking about ju just war, secularist, religious folk, everybody. I don't know what happened here. There's a prophecy about this that maybe just came true in 2006, and I think that's in Zephaniah chapter 2 concerning Gaza. I know that still bombs are coming continually over from Gaza into Israel. This is happening all the time. I think it's Zephaniah chapter 2 where it talks about Gaza being enclosed or something like that. And that never happened before 2006 when they built a wall there because of the very fact that so these um, Palestinians, well, we would say actually Syrians, were continually attacking through from the Gaza Strip into Israel. And then after they put the wall up, attacking through tunnels. Did you happen to look that up? Uh, let me look at that. Is it Zephaniah chapter 2? I haven't thought of this for a while. Zephaniah 2, because that has some bearing on today. Let's see. <laughs> There. I never really left, actually. But, uh, okay. Yeah, uh, chapter 2 of Zephaniah, starting at verse 4. Gaza will be abandoned and Ashkelon left in ruins. And so this is a um, judgment on Philistines. It says, I'll destroy you and none will be left. Well, we know that that section 
of Israel is, is walled off. It, it was left by the Israelites. It was a resort area for rich people. And Israel took all the rich people out of there, opened it up to any of the Palestinians that wanted to go there. Then, because there was so much hostility, they built a wall there. Now, I don't think that that ever happened with Gaza before, but it happened in our time, 2006. But there are all kinds of prophetic words about Philistia in here. And there have been a number of books written here lately, exactly who were these people. You know, what we've got is mainly mythology here with uh, David and Goliath and the giants of Gath and King Og and these other guys. So what is a just war? You can't, you can't decide what a just war is unless you have some basis for your morality. So I would slightly disagree with you there um, in the sense that I actually kind of lean more towards what Paul says of um, the things of nature are a sufficient testimony to moral values. Um, he lived in a moralless world, though. We're talking about things that the Bible condemns that he can't, he can't add them to nature, like like you said, abortion and uh, random killing of people and slavery and some of these other things. It was the law that they put down that was the basis for their morality. Well, so for example, we know that uh, we know that uh, killing you know, pretty much everybody in in no matter where you live believes that. Um, what, what, what people would call murder is wrong. Um, but uh, there's a cultural dynamic in order to justify certain things. And um, there's this, um, basically because the culture tells people that, that abortion is acceptable, um, people are desensitized to it because they are being told to ignore the natural yeah. evidence. But I think people, if you, if you were not born in a culture that said abortion is good, if you did, if you were just in a, in a regular tribe, uh, I think you would feel some level of possible guilt. When I say possible, it would be, it would cross your mind. Is this okay or not? You might you might not think you might not think oh this is definitely wrong but you would it would cross your mind of this might not be right the whole, the whole idea of killing um, what is in what is in the womb it, it is something which on a gut reaction level seems wrong you don't really even need necessarily scripture to just have a sense that it's wrong. Um, but we come from a world where they tr we try not to approach things from, uh, what feels wrong, but we, we focus more on wanting something to be right. And so we, because we want it to be right, we make excuses or arguments for it. Um, so, you know, another thing would be like, there, there's a lot of sexual perversion today. Uh, especially with the pornography issues that our world faces. And, but many people, many people have convinced themselves it is healthy. There's nothing wrong with watching it or, or doing those type of things. But a normal person who is not trying to justify themselves will feel gross after they watch something. Uh, that they know they're not supposed to be watching, or they they will feel defiled by it. Oh yeah, that that's what the, that's the normal natural reaction. But people start justifying it and making excuses. When they start doing that, then they become desensitized to what nature's trying to tell them. Uh, I, I would say something similar to homosexuality. I I feel like 
it should be so clear and obvious that it's that it that they, it's, something's not right. Um, but they want it to be right so much that they they have to believe it's true because if they don't believe it's true, then that means they're in the wrong, and they don't want to be in the wrong because they want it so much. So there are some things that you can't even fathom to be right. That's that's one to me. I can't even fathom how anyone would would enjoy that or same with mercy killing or killing children uh lately i've been looking into this pizza gate thing it's been going on here for for years and some swear that there is a, a large cabal of celebrities and politicians that are sucking the blood out of uh, children that they have killed in order to get a certain chemical in there that makes them young again. Now that sounds that sounds crazy to me, but yeah, uh, I, I don't personally believe that. But I know people have said that. Well, look at well, one person in particular has described this, and that's Mel Gibson, who's a I would say he's a pretty I would say that he would be telling the truth about this where other people wouldn't because of his upbringing. And uh, he's, he says that he has witnessed these things at some of these bacchanal parties that these elites have been having. And then there's the matter of so many children disappearing all over the place. And um, there was even, I even know a woman that I used to work with that told me about her parents being satan satanic ritual abusers and that two of her sisters had been sacrificed already and that she had been made to do all these things with, with uh, adults when she was just a very young person. I don't understand how anyone could think that would be moral or acceptable, except people that are just totally screwed. And that goes for the Catholic Church, too. Again, 90% Catholic priests, according to inside, inside uh, statistics, are homosexuals and child molesters. I mean, what do we, what do, we do with that? I've been in the pastoral ministry. I can't imagine doing that. But I've had a couple of, of youth directors that were into that and had to fire them because they got caught doing something in the church that I was in. It just blew my mind. Like, how can you do that and claim that you're a believer? Where do you get your moral compass for things like that? Um, it makes you think that there is an underlying evil power that is feeding some people in their the area of their appetites. And I think there are a lot more people doing these things than, than we can possibly imagine. I don't want to get in too deep with that, because a lot of times you start talking about things like that, and then you become exposed to your own problems. Exposed in the sense of like- Well, a lot of people that uh, accuse, like in the Catholic Church again, there are certain priests that accuse others of these things. Uh, one of the the fellow that wrote the book on this Catholic priest scandal here, a French man, French, um, um, a French journalist wrote it. He was deep in with the Catholics and he was deep in with some of the moguls of the church and he experienced these things, saw them himself. He was in that world. He was part of that world. But what he said was, that if these items come up in public, the ones that deny them the most are often the ones that are actually involved in them. He said this is very true of priests. If it comes up in public, if it comes up in debate, 
the ones that are most involved in these things get out front and tell uh, the public at large how horrible these things are when they themselves are entirely vested in these same sins or crimes. Yep. This, this has happened in, in a lot of different areas like politics as well. We remember not long ago, Richard Wiener, <laughs> that scandal with him. I thought both, it was Anthony. Well, they since that time, they've exposed. You can look at the picture he sent and read about the things that he and his wife did. And he was, uh, he and his wife both are, <clears throat> are, uh, have been accused of being a part of these child molesting and blood drinking sessions. So that's all come out since at the time, you know, we didn't really know what did he do, what didn't he do, but it's all now on the web and you can go see for yourself, but he was one that really come forward for moral causes and, uh, and had himself elected on the basis of law and order and morality. And here he's like one of the ones, and even his wife, that are actually doing these things that he's condemning. Yeah. All right, that's all I got to say. Um, so I, I wanted to say about that, um, you know me, I tend to be non-conspiratorial in a lot of these things um, in the sense that a lot of conspiracies I don't subscribe to because I don't see compelling evidence for them. Yeah. Um, but I also had experience with people saying things that are not true. So for example, um, I'm not going to name names, but uh, the first person I was in a relationship with many, many years ago, so my first ex, um, we met online on a religious website, a blog. You may know it uh, in the past. I don't know if it's still active, but it, Nazarene Space yeah. um, oh, by yeah. uh, James Trim. It's still there. And... Right. and um, so I met her there and we had a, a nice relationship when, it, when we were together. And then, and then after things ended, it ended because she didn't agree with my beliefs. And so she wanted to end it. And she also believed that she was still married to a prior guy. Oh, uh, it was crazy stuff. But anyway, yeah, I understand. any excuse. Yeah. So then like, you know, a, a year or two later, she's rewriting history, saying things that aren't true, twisting things I said. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things, you know, she claimed that she was a victim of uh, satanic ritual abuse. And, um, and then she started saying things like that I was part of the Freemasons and that I was uh, that the elites sent me there to harass her by um, by sneaking into a relationship with her and all kinds of weird stuff. That like, sounds like a megalomania to me. Yeah, I, I, I see. Really I saw tra up. traits of schizophrenia, paranoid schizophrenia in her. Yeah. But like I said, I didn't mention her name because <laughs> that's not what this is about, mentioning her. People's well, normally we'll get stuck with her and she'll go through divorce after divorce. Right. But, but the re I, reason I bring it up is she's saying these type of conspiracy things that I know for a fact mm -hmm. are not true because she's saying them about me. So because I've gone through these false accusations and conspiratorial uh, slandering, I look at these other people and I, I believe that a lot of the same type of conspiratorial slander is going on just because it's like so let's say the politicians like like uh the pizza whole pizza gate thing uh with, with uh -huh. clinton, with, i don't believe hillary clinton is involved in any way or um with anything why, like that. why don't you because you looked into this or just because you think well, that hillary any, is such an upright person 
I don't see evidence for it. And I also think that those type of things, not 100%, but most of the time, you're uh-huh. going to see more men doing that type of crazy stuff. Not so much women. You will have a, a rare woman here and there who will be morally horrible like that. But most yeah. of the time, like um, the, the worst killers and and sexual offenders have all been men predominantly um so well well, the reason what i was saying is that it doesn't mean she's a good person just because she's not guilty of what they're accusing her of like it doesn't have to be an either or thing like so i feel like some people sometimes feel like if you don't believe this about her, then you're saying that she's a good person. And that's not necessarily the case. <clears throat> so um, I, I just know that through my own experience, I've had, I've suffered many false accusations mm-hmm. and distortions, misrepresentations, misrepresentations of who I am, what I believe, what I've said. You know, there's the, there was the whole fiasco with me being a Satanist. Yeah. Uh, oh, what a fiasco that was. Um, <clears throat> Yeah. So, you know, anybody could understand that if it was just explained to them. I think that those guys that were after you on that account just wanted to be. Oh, good. Here's something we can get against this guy. Let's go after him with everything we can. Yeah. And to explain to people why, you know, it's kind of a funny story. I'll just briefly mention it. All right. I was telling people that I was a hypothetical Satanist. And what I meant by that was that if God told me to do something that was morally wrong, I wouldn't do it. You know, like if God told me to, to, to rape someone or something like that, I, w- I, I would refuse to do it. That's what I was saying at the time. Um, so... I was saying hypothetical because I, I don't believe God would ever command us to do something evil like that. But if he did, I would refuse to obey it. Uh, and one of my arguments was that how do we know it's actually God telling us this? You know, what if it's someone pretending to be God? We, we, according to the Bible, people can claim to be an angel and they're actually a demon. So uh, because of that, you know, if, if someone claims to be God and is saying for me to start killing everybody, I'm going to say, I don't think God's going to tell me that. I think, you know what, I don't think God said that. And I'm going to refuse to obey this command. I'm going to, I'm going to disobey. On the chance, this, this might be God telling me to do this, but because I'm not sure, I'm going to disobey it. And this might make me a rebel against God and in that sense that I might be rebelling against God I'm hypothetically a Satanist because I was defining a Satanist as someone rebelling against God Mm -hmm. so that's how the whole thing of oh he claiming he's saying he's a Satanist Ah." yeah you know rumors will fly so now I try to be a little bit more careful in the hypotheticals I use but, How about uh, the rest of you guys? You ever been uh, the the butt of rumors that really hurt you or did you harm? All right. If you want, you, if you want, you can I had one. I had one where my uh, ex-wife slandered my name through uh, social media, and like she went into everybody that she knew that was uh, associated with me as a, a friend. And she started saying a bunch of horrendous things about me, making these outlandish claims that she couldn't prove. And I ended up uh, taking it to a lawyer and got a letter of cease and desist, or you know, she would have got sued for slander because she, yeah. she wouldn't be able to prove it. But it was just uh, crazy to have, oh, and she specifically targeted the friends and family of my girlfriend at the time, who's now my wife. Mm-hmm. So it was out of acts of jealousy that she did it and it yep. was uh it was stressful because uh it created seeds of doubt in her my uh now wife's family so they hardly knew me and then they heard all these crazy things about me and then they didn't know what to think you know right. it, so it was it was pretty unfortunate but the heavenly father helped us work through it thankfully 
Wow. Okay. Have we done that enough? Are you ready for a question? Hello? Am I still here with you or is everything hung up? I hear you. Okay. I think only has the one that's uh, hung up. up. Well, let's see if we can get him back. Here he comes. And again. He's on a cell. He's running choppy tonight, I guess. Jeez. Sorry, guys. That's okay. I had an internet problem. So, what happened to our other guy? Was he was he was he scared off by the PizzaGate stuff? No, he he has internet problems. He has he comes on and goes off. He's using a public internet. Oh, okay. that's Jesse. And so this happens every time he gets on. He he gets clicked off, and then he has to get back on and clicked off. Seems okay. like this last, you know, these uh, updates for Microsoft, they all come at any time, no matter how you set them up to come. Mine came yesterday in the middle of a recording session, and it just locked everything up. Yeah. It locked everything up. Kicked me out of my microphones. I thought, what's going on? I spent an hour and a half trying to figure out. And then when I went off, I saw that uh, update was pending. Enjoyed it. All right. So Emerson, uh, parents, state of Israel, and what was the third one? Sorry, I, I got cut out again, so the whole thing got deleted again. Let's see, chat? Yeah, in the chat, he had said two. What does it mean to honor one's mother and father? And what if your parents are evildoers? Yeah. There we go. All right. So that's a good one for you. Um, well, you know, if, if Jackson is your father, then you definitely don't want to honor him. That's for um, sure. Especially if you're one of my grandchildren. No, yeah, that's yeah. but any anyone else you should even 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 if like Satan's your father, you want to honor him. Um, no. it, in my belief, actually, though, honor your father and mother, I think actually applies regardless of whether your parents are righteous or not. Um, so even if they're the most wicked parents on earth, I think you're still supposed to honor them. But what does honor mean? You know, um, I don't think it necessarily means like exclusively good stuff. Um, the commandment does say pretty much what it means. It implies what it means if you remember the whole commandment. Can somebody remember it? There's a promise that goes with it. So that it'll be well with you? Hmm. Yeah, it has something to do with you honor your parents as they get old because uh, you'll live, so you'll live long in the land. But I think there's a matter of adjudicating whether your parents are honorable or not. Well, so here, the way I see it is that honor doesn't necessarily mean like good stuff necessarily. Like, like, you know, like for example, if someone says I will reward you with death or something like that, you know, I'll reward you with death, you know, um, reward you think automatically of a positive meaning, but if someone says, I will reward you with death, that's not really a good thing. That's a bad thing. Um, or I'll reward you with a beating or something like that, you know? Um, so if, if oh. someone says honor, it's kind of like you will give them the, the, what is due to them. So it could actually be, you know, a negative thing sometimes. Uh, but what, but what I think specifically, when it comes to right, like when it comes to good honoring, 
even even the most evil parents, I think there's some level of good honoring you should give them in the sense that they're your parents. So uh, Peter and the homilies of Clement, you know, we've talked we talk all the time about the Clementine oh, writings. Yeah. Well, in those writings, Peter makes the argument. He says that if God himself was more evil than could possibly be described by any man ever, if he was a super evil being, I would still uh, honor him as my creator and, and serve him and submit to him as my God. And what, basically what he's saying is that even if, even if he's evil, he's still my God. Even if he's evil, he's still my creator. So there's a certain level of appreciation you that they that he's owed. Just because he's evil doesn't mean he's not owed it. Um, so if someone if someone uh, did something really amazing and they they they, they uh, let's say they cured cancer or something, you would be like, wow, that was a really amazing thing they did. That was a good thing, right? You would say. But then later on he shoots up a, a school and, and, and commits mass murder. Well, that was a very horrific thing that he did. And so that horrific thing he did, though, doesn't nullify the good that he did prior to that. It just means he's a bad person overall, but it doesn't mean everything he did was bad. So you should honor him for the good thing that he did, and you should dishonor him for the bad thing he did. So with your parents... You honor them for the good stuff, and you dishonor them for the bad stuff. You know, it says in the New Testament, you have to hate your father and mother. Mm -hmm. But it also says, love your enemies and honor your parents. So how do you hate your parents and honor them? You hate your parents by hating the bad parts about them. You honor them by honoring the good parts about them. And the good part is that they created you. They made you come into existence on this earth. That, that's an amazing thing that they did for you. And you will be forever in their, in their debt and gratitude for what they did for you. Because of that, there's a certain honor that is owed to them from you specifically. That's the way I see it. You will, you will always have some amount of debt of gratitude to your parents, no matter how evil they are. They're your parents. They brought you into this world. You so, are uh, you are speaking of a, a definition that is almost exactly like that of John Calvin. Let me read that and see if you hmm. agree with it. Since, therefore, the name of Father is a sacred one and is transferred to men by the peculiar goodness of Elohim. The dishonoring of parents rebounds to the dishonor of Elohim himself, nor can anyone despise his father without being guilty of an offense against Elohim, that is, sacrilegium. If any should object that there are many ungodly and wicked fathers whom their children cannot regard with honor without destroying the distinction between good and evil, the reply is easy, that the perpetual law of nature is not subverted by the sins of men, and therefore, however unworthy an honor a father may be, that he still retains, inasmuch as he is a father, his right over his children, provided does not in any wise derogate from the judgment of Elohim, for it's too absurd to think of absolving under any pretext the sins which are condemned by his law. Nay, it would be a base profanation to misuse the name of Father for the covering of sins. Well, I read like the first half of that and it made sense to me, and I thought you were going right along with that, but I don't know if somebody can explain that or not. I, I've i never really delved much into Calvin's writing, so... All right. I didn't know Calvin uh, used Elohim and. Uh, no, no. Nah, I'm just joking. I just don't use gold. And I thought the same thing. 
<laughs> yeah, I don't use gold. I, I just think it's he, a gold. He he was he was a pioneer of the Hebrew roots movement. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, of the sacred, sacred name movement. <laughs> you you don't use goat. Well, I don't I don't use God except if I'm talking to people that don't know any difference. Right. I'm going to use Elohim instead because there is absolutely no relation between God and Elohim. I mean, in a linguistic sense, there's no relation between the two. God is the name of a heathen Elohim that we find in the scriptures. Uh, God in Hebrew means lucky. G-A-D, that's pronounced God. There's a son of Jacob named God, G-A-D. Remember that A is not like in English. It's an ah sound. And God, his name is just means lucky. So when we're talking about God, we're naming the God of luck that is mentioned in the Bible. And I wish right now I could think of the chapter and verse for some reason it's not coming to me but it it talks about not worshiping god and the other god's name is money m e n e pronounced money g a d and m e n e look it up and see so those two are names of god but it just so happens that they come over in english phonetically to God and money, where God means luck, and money means um, 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 prosperity. There we got it. So you, in English, it just happens to be God and money. In Hebrew, it means luck and prosperity, but the actual names of those Assyrian gods are G A D and M E N E. Take a look. Why, why can't I think of where that is right now? That's in Isaiah. I would ask you to take a look at it. I will say yeah, about El it. Elo Elohim. Oh yeah, here it is. Isaiah sixty-five. Isaiah sixty-five. Eleven. And of course, it's going to be hidden in false language depending on which bible you're looking at it's um it's uh uh isaiah 65 11 if you can get here we go new king james version g-a-d fortune or luck M-E-N-I here is destiny, but ye are they that forsake Yahweh, that forget my holy mountain, that prepare a table for God, G-A-D. Here it says for that troop, which is, you know, that's spurious. <laughs> and furnish the drink offering unto many, that is destiny or prosperity. So you see the King James Version, even the New King James, it is, it's messed up. I would also argue, though, that Elohim itself is um, not a valid term. Uh, of course my, it is. In my belief, it's not a valid term. How can it not be when you see it a thousand, two thousand, three thousand times in the Hebrew Old Testament? How can because you say it's not valid? I think they substituted it in for, I believe Elohim originated as a polytheist uh, designation. Oh, and so go, find it, go find some proof instead of just your opinion. So, le, le, so let me tell you, let me tell you here. Um, so, you know, you know, the ancient uh, languages like Ugaritic and other, basically they're, they're sister languages to Hebrew. Yeah. Um, so in those languages, 
you don't see any other you ne you don't see a singular like you don't see Elohim as a singular in in any of those sister you languages. in Ugaritic and in Ebla and the Ebla tablets it's in there hundreds and hundreds of times as a singular yes e l as a singular no, no yeah e l as yeah 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 e l but i mean elohim singular? what elohim i'm saying is just plural it's it's Magically. a in in the um in the old testament elohim is used it's a plural word but it's used for a singular entity most of the time i think this here's my theory my hypothesis if i could be wrong um, but I believe, like, you know how it says Yahweh Elohim in many, many times? Yahweh yeah. Elohim? Mm -hmm. sometimes, sometimes it says Elohim, just Elohim. Sometimes it says just Yahweh. And sometimes it says Yahweh Elohim. Of course, two different redactors. I one's believe. The, one's the E source, one's a J source. Right. And, and I believe that Yahweh is a replacement often of multiple words sometimes it's a replacement of Baal and other times it's a replacement of Adon we know Adon means Lord um, or master and that's used sometimes in the Old Testament uh, you know Adonai and so I believe based on Ugaritic writing there, there's a phrase in Ugaritic writing it's Adon Elohim Adon Elohim and it mean it basically would mean Lord of gods, Lord of gods. And in the Old Testament, in a few places in the Old Testament and in the Dead Sea Scrolls, it refers to Yahweh as king of the gods, king of the gods. So um, and in the book of Enoch, it says, uh, I believe it says king of the gods or, and Lord of the gods. So um, so this, my, my understanding is that Elohim originated as a longer phrase, it, a longer phrase of Lord of Gods. So Lord Elohim, Lord of Elohim. And then over time, uh, because the polytheism was considered objectionable, the idea that multiple gods exist, because um, we know according to the Bible, multiple gods do exist. We're just only supposed to worship the one. We're not supposed to worship worship the lesser ones. That, that's called um, what's it called? Uh, monolatrism, I believe. Uh, monolatry. Yeah, monolatry. Um, and this idea is very much evident in Scripture that there are many gods. You know, Scripture says God of gods, Lord of lords, King of kings. There's an ultimate king, an ultimate lord, an ultimate god, or ultimate El of Elohim and so uh, I believe originally the term Yahweh Elohim was Adon Elohim and over time because the idea of multiple gods was considered objectionable the the references to Elohim in scripture had to be changed to singular meaning so instead of of gods they changed the interpretation to oh it just means one god so i think whenever you see elohim all throughout scripture that that is a, a distortion and that the original either said eloa eloa singular or just l singular that describes inserted elohim all throughout uh because elohim originally was plural but it became a singular word over time due to the objection by scribes of a polytheistic idea again you're talking about scribes and i know adonai came in much later with the masoretes at least from what i have read because it it um it originates in the word aten Aten, which is the name of the unseen Elohim, unseen Eloa of Egypt in the time of Akhenaten. And when we read about it being plural in here, we still use this grammatical rule. 
especially in British English, Elohim is the plural of majesty. So anyway, that's what we're told. Now you've got your theories and some are pretty cool, but uh, this is one that maybe you need not get so deep into. But well, like, for, what, what do you call your God? It's Baal now, isn't it? Sefer Baal? So I identify, yes, it is. I identify Yahweh and Baal as the same entity. Your God is Baal. <laughs> but see, little b. Make No, capital. A capital B? But we have to change it to L. You mean like Baal and the dragon? Yeah, Be Bell uh, is the same. It's related, Bell and Baal. Yeah, right. Um, I've done I've done videos on that type of thing before. You know, uh, that's a controversial theory. Uh, but I want to make clear to some people, uh, you know, if people are watching this, I don't know if you're putting this on radio or anything like that, but basically... People are um, hankering to hear you. The, 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 the thing that I believe, it's, it's just a matter of names. It's all, it's all a matter of names. So, um, like, I even believe, for example, I believe Zeus is, is uh, the same. I believe uh, Jupiter is the same. And um, I think it's Thor, yeah. So what uh, about the mythology of Thor and Jupiter? Because you can't, you might place the name with our Elohim, but you can hardly place the mythology. I think a lot of the mythology is, is uh, it overlaps. Uh, it's not all valid, uh, but I think a lot of it is, it's kind of like saying, it's kind of like saying, imagine if you have a, a group of, well, you know, the Gnostics. The Gnostics believe that Yahweh was an evil God, right? Yeah. And um, so they clearly are talking about the same being, but they're attributing very bad things to, yes. to, that, to that being. In a similar way, I think that these other people attribute false things to, to our God or to our El, but that, that doesn't mean that they are not worshiping the same entity. It's just that they are slandering the 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 same entity. They're slandering him, or they're they're falsely accusing him of things that are not true. Okay, like folks, having, you make your own you you uh, make your own opinion. No, you have to follow whatever I say. If you don't yeah, follow well, what I say, then then you're banned from these uh, meetings from now on. No, it seems sorry. like everybody has a different theory about this, and. Usually they'll pick it up off YouTube. They won't do like you and I do. That is to get in deep into the history. They'll say, oh, Michael Roots believes this. He's got to be right. You know, or uh, Jim Staley or uh, Kenneth Copeland. <laughs> Kenneth Copeland. He's funny. Kenneth Copeland. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, I, like I said uh, to Emerson, uh, this is a big topic. And certainly we can't cover it all in this. So we should definitely do like some deeper study on this though, because I have a lot to say on this topic. It's been something I studied a lot in 2019 and a little bit in 2020, but a lot of it was 2019 where I really dove deep into it and found some really compelling stuff uh, that really- Why don't you ask for comments then? Let's ask for comments on well, this. Emerson we'll get all kinds made, of different ones. Emerson made a comment. He, he, about what we were talking about, he well, said, or you mean comments on something else? Emerson, we're going to have to kick him out of the heart because he doesn't agree with me. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, no. Unity and diversity, not diversity and conflict. I, I was saying that he, he was uh, saying his theory, and I said uh, about the topic, and I said that's something that I, I think it'd be cool to talk about some more. Oh, yeah. But um, I don't want the rest of this one to be focused on that because there were a couple other things I wanted to uh, focus on. And that was earlier what Emerson said okay. in the very beginning. And the one that I kept asking him to 
keep reposting. So basically, he was talking about um, his belief that, or not his belief, but he heard from some people say that the state of is uh, that he said that they made some good arguments that the state of Israel is not the same as the ancient government of Israel. So what would you have to say about that, Jackson? Say that again? Basically, is the modern country of Israel um, a fulfillment of what scripture says? That, That's that a real hard one. Of Israel being Israel? That's really hard. And I, I'll tell you, I'm on the fence about that. I'm convinced it is. Um, and the reason I believe it is is because you can't judge the state of Israel being authentic or valid based on its righteousness. Because throughout the history of the Bible, Israel has been thoroughly corrupt and wicked. There was not really much, almost ever a time where Israel was pure. There was a few, a few rare times, but most of the time they were idol worshippers. They murdered people. Uh, that they that didn't that? deserve to die. Israel, ancient Israel. Yeah, oh yeah. They they killed people. You know, Saul was a murderous fool. He murdered the priests, massacred them. And uh, Saul uh, murdered the Gibeonites. And and, uh, and all kinds of crazy stuff we see in the Old Testament that the, that the Israelites committed against other nations. Crimes. And crimes against their own people. So... Israel was not the perfect nation. They were corrupt throughout their history. They were full of sin and, and lawlessness. They disobeyed the Torah so much. So what do we see modern Israel? Modern Israel disobeys the Torah a lot. They have a lot of people of other religions uh, there. They, there's just a lot of corruption there. But it's really no different than ancient Israel. And if you want to talk about governments, ancient Israel originally started out as a as just a bunch of judges. Well, originally it was just a bunch of tribes. Then judges started ruling. After the judges came kings, and then after the kings came the Maccabees, and and all kinds of changes happened. And then uh, during the time of uh, during the time of the Romans, the Romans took control and they basically made Israel into like a colony. So yeah. the history of Israel as a nation or a country has changed over time. Originally, it was a just a regular tribe. Then it became... They, they changed the priesthood. Yeah. They changed the calendar. Mm -hmm. They changed everything. They changed their affiliations with the Kittim. They changed uh, whatever they could change to get out of the will of Yahweh. And th those things, when you think of modern Israel, you think, hey, this is a miracle in 1948 and 1967, and it is a sign to the unbeliever in regards to Israel in the final days. However, again, what is this religious uh, religion made up of in Israel today when a uh, Gentile has to has to swear they're not going to keep the Sabbath and swear that they're not going to use the sacred name in order to live there. These things are against Torah, as well as this Noahide thing that they are imposing on anybody that goes over there and wants to stay there. There is no Noahide law. That's just uh, made up by the Pharisees. So, yeah, I, what do you do about things like that in light of the 6748 miracles? Where is modern Israel? Maybe it's not to be reconstituted as an actual nation. Maybe we're the beginning of reconstituting it as a nation with a liberal understanding of the Torah and our attempts to try to keep it, even though we are dispersed throughout the world. Or maybe America is the new promised land. It could be. Greater Israel. You go look on, look on a, a road map. Just go down and see the names of cities. You'll see five or seven out of ten of them named after biblical places. That, it, that doesn't mean anything. But it, it certainly 
it certainly would make you believe that the founders of these cities in this nation were in deference to the Bible. Oh, yeah. All right. When you get the answers, let me know to that. I, I don't know what to say about that. I'd like to think so. Let's see. You know, for the Zionist, religious Zionists today, it most definitely is. Like, I've had talks with uh, Robert Eisenman about this on various occasions. You might have been in on one of those once. I don't know. But this question came right up. And he was talking about the rebuilding of the temple there and that his brother was slated to do, well, he was, his brother was in the running to do the architectural work for that temple. And that he said, if, if and when they do, they certainly don't want to copy Herod's version of the temple because he said that's highly, it's highly polluted and has little uh, resemblance to what Judaism was before it was usurped. Well, I guess we're seeing that in this country too right now. It's being usurped by communists, no doubt about it. Yeah, I, don't I, I like that. communists. <laughs> I went over to uh, the East Europe when I was a teenager. I was in a, I was in a symphony orchestra I played violin, and I spent uh, a summer Czechoslovakia, Austria, Poland, East Germany. And what I saw there from uh, 50 years of communism at that time, the kids my age were wretched in rags. In Prague, nobody dared walk out on the streets because they still had towers up on the street corners with gunmen in them all the so, whole hey, yeah hey jackson i have to uh second that because i spent three months in budapest yeah tell and, us about that yeah so you know and that was uh, a hebrew girl that i had met and i was living over there for a little while and um it was they still had the concentration camp trains Mm -hmm. uh, on the side when we would take the train into town and you could still see the bullet holes from, you know, every ruling power from the Nazis to communism. Uh, now, I understand what you're saying, Onya. Yes, a form of communism, what you're talking about, but Marxism that destroyed these countries and and enslaved these people, that, that's a whole different ballgame. True, true. I, I think that younger people just don't realize what a uh, life and death struggle it was with communism in the 50s and 60s in this country. And us older people, we remember that. And how even today people like McCarthy and Nixon big anti-communists are considered to be horrible people because they were trying in the 50s and 60s to get the communists out of the government. And uh, I think that would be a very good idea to get them out now because communism, atheism, everything that goes along with it will destroy what freedoms and privileges we have here, as it did uh, in John's testimony here, they still have all the bullet holes and everything going on there. And by the way, Yugoslavia was um, a communist nation, but it was one of the worst as far as violence goes. Not only in the Second World War, in the Second World War, you know, the, even the the people in Croatia and and you and uh, uh, the rest of what was called Yugoslavia at that time, were very excited about getting rid of the Jews because they were allowed to take their possessions. You get rid of them, you take their possessions. Communism, I think the same kind of attitude just moved into a different regime during the times uh, post-Second World War. And people just don't realize that. 
you can still go over to East Germany, East Berlin today, and it's still shitty. Yeah, it's not uh, like West Berlin. The the Germans though were not communists. They were socialists. National socialists. But they they hated communism though. Well, Hitler did, but yeah. a lot of Germany wanted socialism, and that was Hitler's. The Jews weren't his biggest foe. The communists were because he hated Russia. He hated Stalin. He hated everything about that. In fact, he hated everybody. You know, but I mean, Eastern Germany was controlled by the communists at one time. So that's right. I saw the wall when it was up. We got stuck in between the two walls in East and West Germany stuck in between a no man's zone for 17 hours there while they went through everything. And then on the border of Czechoslovakia, we were going through there and I was asleep in the back of the bus we were on and somebody hit me in the face. And I woke up and there was a Russian soldier standing right in front of me. He slapped me in the face because he wanted to see my passport. Now, he, he didn't just want to say, wake him up or something like that. He wake, up, wake, up, Jack, wake, wake up, Jackson. Wake up. <laughs> yeah, he struck me with his fist. Jackson, and, you know, you, to wake up and see that guy standing there full uniform and everything. Right, so is there, is, there, is there a question that we need to answer? So I'm going to slap you in the face now. Is there a question that we need to answer here on this biblical talk? No. <laughs> If you ever want to relive that experience, Jackson, I'd be happy to slap you in the face. I know you would. Uh, I do have a question for you guys. <laughs> How many people here are um, self-identify as a dentist? Or, or, or have no problem with being identified as a Zionist? They might not necessarily identify themselves, but if someone says you're a Zionist, you don't object to that. Well, so, is it, are you talking about religious Zionism or secular Zionism? Because they're two different things. Just in general, if someone says, talks about Zionism or being a Zionist, how do people react? You're, you're saying there's two different types. So. Yeah, I'd say yes, generally, yes. We need to have Israel in that particular spot. And now we've got another Muslim country that is making peace with Israel. And you're going to see in the next few years um, several more coming around, too. There's already been, like, the third country. So we need them in that area. They've got the power. So I'm all for building up Israel. I'm a Zionist oh. in that respect. Well, I was going to tell you, Anya, interesting question, because I had this conversation with a friend of mine that I reconnected with. We graduated together, but 15 years later, you know, the other club, about two weeks ago, we came together and we had a conversation. And he's very well studied in uh, some history. You know, he's, he's now gone into some occultic things. He's read all the writings of, um, you know, Hitler, everything. But I noticed, uh, you know, I had to clarify with him. He continued to say some things. I was like, well, you, you sound very anti-Semitic or you sound very racist towards, I'm not going to say the Jewish people, but the Hebrew people. And then I said, well, actually, let me clarify. What do you call a Jew? What do you call a Zionist? And he explained, you know, dark orthodoxy. Um, you know, so we did get to hash that out. So, it, it, you know, it's like, what does one call Zionism? Um, is it the the Pharisaical version, or is it the one that we believe in? You know, to go to Mount Zion. So, and I really had to clarify that with him. And when I explained our side, and I say our side, us believing in, you know, sorry, I'm trying to be hearing a beeping in my background. <laughs> my radar is sticking. But I had to clarify with him what he's calling about these evil Zionists now. And he was he was kind of throwing me into the same category, but then I had to, you know, kind of 
tell some things to him, but but then he said, yeah, it's, it's the one that, you know, what, what's going on in the world now when it comes to, um, well, if you believe that the Orthodox, the Shabbat, the things of dark Judaism that kind of pretty much run the world, then yes, there is a, uh, there's a question that, you know, what type of Zionist are you? For me, I see that uh, there's, I, I believe strongly in the building of the temple. I also believe in the war scroll, a future war. If the war scroll, war scroll, excuse me, war scroll is authentic prophecy, um, you know, some people might take the war scroll and just say it's a uh, hypothetical war that didn't actually happen. But it seems to describe something that they believed would truly happen according to these details as if it was actual prophecy. And I believe whether or not it's prophecy, they might actually try to bring it about. And I believe that they will be justified in bringing it about. So what I think is going to happen is they're going to build a temple. They first have to tear down that abomination known as the Dome of the Rock. So they'll, they'll tear it down. And then they'll start building the third temple. When they're building the third temple, all the Muslim Arab people are going to go crazy and think that this is horrible and this is an injustice. And they're going to start, a, they're, they're basically going to go to war against Israel uh, over this. But I believe uh, Israel is justified in this. Anya, I have one question. Uh, the temple that we're speaking of, are we speaking of the temple spoken of in Ezekiel? I believe that the temple in Ezekiel is it was it was presented to them as a command and the command is still applicable. So they that, will build the Ezekiel temple. That but, temple because, is bigger than Jerusalem is. Yes, it is. I'm asking, are we talking about a temple that is blended between the temple that is spoken of in Ezekiel as a prophetic futuristic temple? It's not it spoken is, of as futuristic. It's spoken of as a past uh, temple. And we have found that temple uh, in, in Egypt at Amarna. Exactly the same, exactly the same uh, size, same outcome. Exactly, exactly. exactly. Jackson, that, and that's the point that I—that's what I'm trying oh, okay. to point out. Are we saying this this third temple is the one from Ezekiel, but being blended like what I like to call it trail mix with the Daniel nine of the desolation of a temple in a future event? Because that's where that all desolation of a third temple comes in is the blending that happen. okay so, so, so yes yes Antiochus epiphanies in daniel 9 but so you're saying that the ezekiel temple is something near in the future well let's say near but basically my view is that the temple scroll was written by uh -huh. moses or yahweh given to Moses and that in the temple scroll it gives laws for how to build a temple. This, these laws were intended for the, all, all of history. I believe that Solomon actually did in fact build the temple according to the temple scroll's requirements. Then that first temple was destroyed and uh, there was the exile and basically Ezekiel tells the exiles and says to them this is the temple that you are to build. It's a command. It also foretells uh, as a prophecy, because at that time it hadn't happened yet. The building of the second temple hadn't happened yet. So he was saying, these are the conditions that are to be where the temple is to be built. And commanding them, build this temple. Unfortunately, they disobeyed and did not build it properly. And so because they did not build it properly, the Ezekiel prophecy had not been fulfilled according to what it was described. So some people believe that 
because it wasn't fulfilled, it, it never was going to be fulfilled anymore. It was a conditional prophecy and it was not fulfilled. But I believe that while it wasn't fulfilled at that time, it will still be fulfilled because this command that Ezekiel gave, it wasn't, it wasn't build this temple, but if you don't do it, then it's okay. Uh, if, if you build a smaller temple, then it, oh well. It was build this temple, and until you build this temple, you will not be restored to righteousness. So this, this command still applies. Um, right, right. But, so but, I, but, you, but, but you, said, you said something very key. To a people who were in exile, and and at that time, where were they in exile to, and and what people were they speaking to? I believe Bab Babylon, but there was also some of the Jews were in Israel, uh, excuse me, uh -huh. uh, Egypt. Uh, uh -huh. Some of them were in uh, Persia, you know, the Medes and the Persians. Well, and, and you bring up, uh, and the only reason I ask this because you said exactly Egypt. So, what about the Temple of uh, Amarna that hits the exact what Ezekiel is talking about and it's not it doesn't match anything in Jerusalem but it's identical to the Egyptian temple of the Zedekites I'm sorry I'm just throwing a, a thought in there because at that time if we're talking about those who were in a time of dispersion and at that time and you even said the Egyptians so basically, uh, I'm not very well familiar with the, the uh, Egyptian temple, but what I can say is that they were competing temples and that they were not all valid. You know, the, the Samaritans um, believe that their temple was the true temple, uh, Mount Gerizim. Um, I personally would say that if you had to choose between the Samaritan temple and the one in, uh, in Amarna, I would go with the Samaritan one. I think there's more authenticity with that one, um, in my opinion. Uh, but I would go with the Jerusalem one over all of the others because um, from what my understanding of scripture is that Jerusalem is the holy place uh, where the temple was supposed to be built. Whether well, I, I understand that, but, but, but Ezekiel's dimensions don't match Jerusalem. I mean, I, I'm sorry, that's, that's, I mean, Jackson can back that one up, but it's just, yeah, I, I understand that, and that's what I always believe, but until, well, there's some things that don't match up. But Well, it doesn't, it doesn't match Israel the way we currently know it, but the, the thing is we don't know the geography of, uh, as, far as, as far as I understand, we don't have an absolute picture of the geography of Jerusalem in that time period when sure. Ezekiel did his prophecy. Um, there could there could definitely have been major landscape changes. Uh, um, but I believe, like I said, I believe that the, the Ezekiel temple is the same one that the um, temple scroll speaks of. And I believe Solomon actually did in fact build it. But also to keep in mind that the temple that Ezekiel describes is not the same thing necessarily as the Jerusalem that Ezekiel describes. Like uh, Ezekiel describes a Jerusalem that's very large, uh, but the temple is not particularly large. Uh, the temple could, in my understanding, the temple could fit in current uh, current Jerusalem. Yes, the the uh, Solomonic temple or even Herod's temple can fit right alongside the Dome of the Rock. But that temple, as I've said a couple times here, that temple in Ezekiel, I've done a lot of study on that. It is way too big for Jerusalem of today, maybe of Jerusalem in a hundred years, maybe during that time that you think that the uh, war scroll is coming to pass. Yeah, uh, I said a hundred years, perhaps. From even that, the, yeah. even in the New Jerusalem text in the Dead Sea Scrolls, or there's another situation of that, never says Jerusalem. Yet they they entitled that text 
the New Jerusalem text. Right. So that's a that's a big question mark, but we are getting deeper and deeper in to identifying Egypt as a place uh, of Yah's worship, especially from the time of Akhenaten 1350 through the time of the Jerusalem temple. Uh, the one, the Onion temple in Egypt was destroyed the same time. They had two temples going at that time up until 70 AD. Romans destroyed them both. One was in Jerusalem, the other one was in Heliopolis, just according to the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 18 and 19. So, um, again, where is the beef of either one of our understandings of this? Any of our understandings. We just don't have enough yet. And scholars, of course, are broken into two main sections. One is the consensus that's always going to go along with whatever has been before. And the other ones are considered by the consensus scholars to be radical, crazy people. Like, were, you were you talking about my temple earlier? Huh? M my temple. <laughs> the temple? No, I don't think so. Yeah, you said the Anayan, the Anayan temple? Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, the Onayan temple. <laughs> Well, named for Onias the third and fourth, they're the last of the Zadokite high priests. I've been in your temple, right there where you are right now. Hmm. I might be <laughs> one of the few that's been in your temple, and I saw a <laughs> tremendous library of sacred books yep. in your temple. It's impressive. I have even more since then. Yeah. I wouldn't mind Thank keep you. going, but I know you like to end your your yeah. meetings. It's it's about time, I think. Well, that was fast. Let's end it and save it till next time. You all ask somebody else to come if they're interested in this kind of jargon. Look, it doesn't have to be Onia and me talking. Okay. Yeah, it can it can be whoever wants to share. Yeah. And if you're watching this on YouTube or online someplace, you're more than welcome to come in here and quote your opinions. But don't unless forget, you're a unless you're a heretic. Yeah, if you're a heretic, don't come in. Census scholar, <laughs> just as long there's only one person you have to please please here, and that's the star of the show, Andrew. <laughs> if you please him, then we won't take you out of the uh, MP4. Thank Shalom, you all guys. for coming. Shalom. Have a good, have a good Shabbat.